Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to our reincarnation of Call the Doctor. Uh, we've been off for a few weeks. Um, just a few. Just a few. <laughs> right. uh, but we're back. Um, and uh, have we been playing reruns? We have. Yeah, there you go. So, so you see some consistency. But tonight is a new show. And we're introducing a brand new doctor's practice in a doctor that has been practicing here for 18 years. That's correct. Yeah, right. So this is Dr. Chandelle Emanuel, and she is uh, going to tell us about her new uh, internal medicine and pediatric combined practice that just opened up at Squeaky Clean in Nashville. Yes. Right. So tell us a little bit about yourself first, then we'll talk about your practice. Okay. Um, I'm originally from Lumberton, North Carolina, a member of the Lumbee tribe. I moved to Durham where I was raised by my parents when I was around three to four years old. Um, my mom got a full scholarship to go to Duke, which is why I left. Um, my parents actually got married when they were 16 and 17, so wow. I went to their high school graduation. So, um, <laughs> that is too cool. Yeah, so um, a big honor in our family um, to be able to go to college, first of all, and then to get a full scholarship to go to Duke. So that That's was a That's impressive, lot. right. Mm -hmm. So my parents, you know, picked up from their hometown of 16 and 17 years and went to the big city of Durham and my mom went to school at Duke and my dad started working at um, Duke University in the chemistry department as a machinist. Very so good. That's Very how good. I ended up in Durham, and I stayed there all through high school, and ended up going to undergrad at UNC Chapel Hill with a BA in psychology. And um, while I was in grad school, which I went to right after undergrad, I ran a group home for severely, persistently mentally ill adults. And this is during graduate school? During graduate school. In Durham? In, no, in Chapel, Chapel Hill. Hill. Okay. That's very, very, very good yeah. of you, very noble of you. Yes, so right. I worked at night from four to the next morning. Um, they let me sleep from 11 to 7. But that's <laughs> pretty much when I did all my studies. That's that's about when, uh, that's yeah. twice as much sleep as you normally get. Probably, <laughs> and then I went to school during the day. It was hard on your parents as well, wasn't it? Because they it lost all their tribal support systems when they moved to the big city. Yes. Yeah. Um, we are Native American, my entire family. Um, so going from Lumberton to Durham, there was no other immediate families that we knew of and initially. Um, I was the only Native American in high school. Um, so not a lot of support in that area, but we found some family friends um, and connected with them through church and grew up, I grew up with their kids, so at least I had that. And one of their, one of the ladies is my mom's best friend and she's mm -hmm. been my mom's best friend since she was probably about 15 or 16. Tough going, but you made something awesome out of it, right? Yes. Right. Congratulations to you. Yeah. So uh, you've been practicing in Rocky Mount for 18 years. What brought you to Rocky Mount? Um, so after, undergrad after grad school I spent a year in Boston at a post baccalaureate program at Boston University and by and that means after your regular undergraduate program no after correct? my graduate program correct so the program that I was in was for minority students there was 10 of us um, there was two Native Americans two Hispanics and um, six African Americans so we matriculated with the first year med students at Boston University and we were offered a spot there if we chose to stay I did not like the north. <laughs> so I, I really didn't like the cold. Right. And so yeah. um, I was. And eating. Boston gets cold. Yes, and mm. lots of snow. Yes, it does. And no family. I had no family. Right. So just the ten, the other nine people that I met in this program. So I interviewed and applied to go to East Carolina. So you transferred medical schools. Mm -hmm. That's tough to do. I did the same thing for the same reason. Uh, my dad was ill, I needed to get closer to home. And uh, and transferring medical schools is, is difficult. I haven't heard of somebody doing that before. So yeah. yeah. But so came back to North Carolina. I came back to North Carolina. Okay. And I came to Eastern North Carolina, where I had never really been before. I did a summer program here when I was 17. Um, summer adventures for a science mm -hmm. program at ECU. Um, but that was my only experience with Greenville. So I did med school there, um, really fell in love with the med peds program, didn't want to stay necessarily in 
North Carolina, thought I needed to travel some. So originally I wanted to go to South Carolina. Um, I ranked South Carolina first, and then Richmond, Virginia was my second choice, and that's where I ended up. And by, and by rankings, when you apply to medical schools, mm -hmm. we create a, a choice list. Right. And we and rank we <laughs> rank them one through ten, and for they rank us. Right. right, for residency, and right. then you do a, what's called a match. Mm -hmm. So they, I don't know the whole formula system, but there's a big formula that... It changes, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, right. so, so my match was uh, Medical College of Virginia for both internal medicine and pediatrics. Correct. Great. So there's only 16, well, at the time that I was interviewing, there was only 16 programs in the Southeast. Virginia was the furthest north that I looked, and I went all the way down to um, Tampa, um, looked at Texas, Alabama, Mississippi, New Orleans. Um, so I hit the Southeastern states. Um, and the program usually would take anywhere from two to eight students for residency. The one that you liked, yeah. Well, that no, any MedPeds program. Right. Oh, is that right? That's correct. They're very uncommon then. They're very uncommon and they're very small. Why did you decide to do both of them, to do the combination? Um, well, that, that, before you answer that, could you let's explain what MedPeds are? Because we're using abbreviations yes. so the public understands. Uh, that's a combination of two separate residency programs brought together, right, correct? that's correct. So double board certified. That's correct. So it's a combined program of internal medicine and pediatrics. So I took two years of internal medicine prerequisites and two years of pediatrics. And Why? It's combined Why did you decide? I mean, because that's extra work um, to be double board certified. What was the reason that you really wanted to do that? Um, I initially thought I was going to do just pediatrics, uh -huh. um, but in med school I fell in love with adult medicine. Um, so then I was going to do family, but then when I did my family rotation, uh, I had no desire to deliver children mm -hmm. or do general surgery or really do dermatology. And those are all parts of what's in a, a family, family practice. A family practice. Mm -hmm. And pediatrics typically is three to four months of training. And I just felt like that wasn't enough to, for me to feel comfortable taking care of children. Mm -hmm. um, I've always liked complex situations and, and I fell in love with internal medicine, but that's 18 and above. So um, my third rotation was a pediatrics and the board of the director for the pediatric program was an internal medicine and pediatric board certified doctor. Mm -hmm. And they had a program at ECU for med internal medicine and pediatrics. Um, and I contemplated staying, but I really felt like I just needed to get into a bigger area to see more complex adults and children. So that's how I ended up in Richmond. Well, that it situates you or, or prepares you tremendously well for what you're doing in a standalone clinic now, right across from Rib Eyes. Yeah, um, I wanted That's to mention correct. that in, in Nashville. <laughs> but I mean, people, children and adults, both. I mean, you are qualified. It was board certified for both those, and there's an urgent care clinic right beside you in the same building that you can can help out with that too, right? Mm-hmm. We had our second day of opening, we had a gentleman walk in, um, short of breath, fatigue, just general malaise, or tired, he was just feeling tired, run down. Um, the PA started working him up and I heard, we need an ambulance, and I walked around the corner and his heart rate was 34. Um, and would not have known that if we hadn't put him on the monitor. and. To, to have a facility that can do those things, right. Craig, that's uh -huh. so, very fortunate. And he had no idea what his medicines were, what his medical conditions. He did. He did tell us he had diabetes. Mm -hmm. Let, let's back up a, tr uh, a minute, and, and you you left me in Richmond. <laughs> oh, sorry. Right. I don't want. I don't like Richmond. So let's take me out of Richmond, and and I do actually like Richmond. Okay. Yeah, uh, but. Um, there's uh, so you spent how many years there? Four, and then and uh, two in internal medicine, two in peas, and mm -hmm. and then you leave board certified in both. That's impressive. You no, I took my boards when I came to work, so I finished my third step of 
the USMLE. Right, there's a timing yeah, part of it, a but, timing but functionally you, you come to... Board eligible right. to take both. And then you moved to Rocky Mount right away after that? I did. I'm, I'm trying to get to you, what was it this area? Because all docs who settle here, regardless of how well we're trained, we all love it for a different reason. Or maybe it's the same reason. What's your reason for loving it here? So I, I really wanted to do rural health um, after being in a big city for four years. Mm -hmm. right. I wanted to get back to North Carolina because this is where my family is. Right. Um, I wanted to serve a population of indigenous people um, since I'm Native American. So ideally, I wanted to go back home. All of my family, with the exception of my mom, was there. My dad had passed. He passed my second year, at the beginning of my second year of residency um, from complications of diabetes. And so I really wanted to get closer to home. I was married to somebody that was from Chacoinity, North Carolina, mm -hmm. and my mom still lived in Durham. So we, I interviewed up and down the 95 corridor, and he said, there's no way I'm going to, to Lumberton. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, there's no way I'm going back to Greenville. And I did not want to go back to Durham. So right. this was exactly in between. In between. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I interviewed with Dr. Crocker. Um, the event, well, I actually interviewed my first time the end of September. Came back in October for a second look of 2004, and I signed my contract in November. And then I finished my last month of residency here for June 2nd until I graduate June 30th. So and you've been here ever since. Yes. Yeah. And then recently you made a change from an employed position to private practice. Yes. And so an employed position is when you are just that. You work for somebody else and uh, they run the business. Mm -hmm. uh, you, uh, from a physician, we get to see patients, we clock in, we clock out, and the running of the business is something that we don't have to do. We defer that. In, in the most common case to the hospital management or to another private group's management if you work for a, a private doctor, but moving on your own or joining a private practice with a, a chance to becoming a partner in that practice, that's a tough job by itself because you're not just practicing medicine, you have to do things uh, that you've never done before. Because in medical school, how many business classes did you take in medical school? I actually didn't take any, but in my master's program, I have an MPH. And oh, okay. I have oh, good. an accounting background. So you're holding all out on us. There's Sorry. more <laughs> There's more to you than you're yeah, letting so us know. So my master's of public health, um, it's more health policy driven, but it's also as health policy and administration. Right, but the, the, it's still the, the nuances of running a business is something that, generally speaking, we have zero training in, mm -hmm. right? And um, especially in the medical world, because you have to know about special codes that, that, that dominate our existence, right? Yes. Um, and we can't do anything without certain numerical codes that are signed to them, and, and God help you if you put the wrong code into an insurance company. You'll get, in my case, surgeries canceled and things like mm -hmm. that. Would so, you have somebody running your practice from the business perspective? I have a very good team from good. A, from a business perspective. Um, so my office manager. So let me back up a little bit. So I was in a private practice situation when I first came here. So from 2005 until 2017, I was with Eastern North Carolina and that was Dr. Crocker's practice. Uh -huh. Well, we bought, there's a group of us that bought him out in 2007, and he stayed on as the operating manager. Mm -hmm. So there was eight of us that owned that practice from 2007 to 2017. So our first acquisition was really with family healthcare partners out of South Carolina. Mm -hmm. So, but we were shareholders in the company, those that were owners, remained as shareholders. So we still had some stake in the game. Right, so you have some experience in, in setting up a new private practice. Well, I have some experience with private practice. Uh, yeah. not, not necessarily setting up a new practice. Right. Um, and then, so it wasn't until 2020 that I came under leadership of a corporate, a big corporate you know, industry that 
really had a lot of rules and regulations that I wasn't really used to. Um, so, but in terms of the management part of it, I have a office manager that used to do our accounting in for Eastern. Good. So she started with Dr. Crocker. Um, my husband, David Jernigan, does a lot of the behind the scenes with the financials. He has an accounting background. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then we have some other people that help us with the, the billing and coding. So primarily you can concentrate on your patients. Uh, primarily. I'm learning all way too quickly about these CPT codes and, mm -hmm. <laughs> and some of that, um, you know, billing things, but, but I, have, I have help. Who can come to see you? Are you pretty open as far as taking new patients? I am. Anybody that was my patient before, wants to continue to be my patient, or just needs a primary, can come and establish. Or a pediatrician. Or a, or a pediatrician. pediatrician. So you can take care of a, a, a newborn all the way until their adulthood, through their adulthood. Until That's amazing. Yes. Yeah. My first patient um, that I was my first pediatric patient turned 18 in July. Oh, hey. Yeah. One of the things that Dr. Perlmutter and I talked about at the beginning of this show is we want people at home who might be going through something, whether it's pain or not feeling well or whatever, to know there's help and they don't have to feel that way necessarily. And as Dr. Perlmutter often says, there are a lot of things that can be done with not surgery, without surgery. And, oh, you know, most things, right. Most things. Mm -hmm. What do you see, like if you were talking to addressing somebody at home, what are some reasons why you that you see commonly that they're feeling or going through something that the sooner they come and see you, you can really make a difference in their lives? Well, one of the things that's very prevalent in this area is diabetes. Um, and so a lot of this, the common thing, what, things that I think is common, a lot of people kind of push off. Um, run, feeling run down, tired, noticing that you're losing weight, um, you're thirsty a lot, your mouth is dry, you're going to the bathroom a lot more than usual, um, just just general symptoms and people kind of brush it, or, brush it off. Mm -hmm. um, the sooner you're diagnosed and you can, I mean sometimes you can actually start taking care of diabetes by changing your lifestyle without having to go on medications. Um, but if they persist in that and don't get a proper diagnosis and learn how to manage it, it can, it can really have horrible consequences, can't it? It can. It can affect your eyesight, your um, kidney function, your nerves. You know, um, I've seen people come in and tell me that their feet are always burning. Their feet? Their feet. Huh. Diabetic neuropathy start, you know, nerve damage from diabetes, huh. it starts in your feet first. It, and it can affect you in long term ways as well. For example, if you stub your toe and you're poorly controlled or an undiagnosed diabetic, and there's a, a nice lady that was admitted uh, to another hospital out of my office today that I'm going to be probably amputating her toe oh. on Thursday because when she came to me at the tip of its necrotic and x-ray shows there's there's a hole in the bone from a bone infection and uh, she knew she was diabetic but dismissed the severity of it. Um, so she did not develop a relationship uh, that was very good with the primary care uh, provider at, at, to her peril. Mm -hmm. And and these very rapidly translate into lower leg amputations if not dealt with. So it's um, there's always an extreme cost to a disease that's ignored. Mm -hmm. um, and the general public really doesn't really see them because they're not walking around in public. You don't see those people outside their homes because they never go out. Mm -hmm. We don't see the people who had strokes because of their untreated hypertension. So I think... And, for, and tell us what hypertension is. High blood pressure. Okay. okay. Right? And so developing a relationship with a quality primary care provider, and the community has many primary care providers that are exceptional, and that's the theme that we that we want to introduce you on the show with today is you don't have to leave the area. Right. That's been the number one theme of the show from the beginning is that close to home uh, and even far from home, there are providers that are worth the drive, right? There are providers around here that can deliver quality work for you. Um, 
that is unsurpassed. So and we'll do, we're going to discuss this. But I want to take a break for a second. Uh, but you might forget my question. Uh, I'll, I'll write it down for you. <laughs> okay. uh, but we're going to take a break for a second, okay. and then we're going to come back and talk to Dr. Manuel about some of the disease processes that she takes care of. board has really put a strong emphasis on um, addressing social determinants of health because we know if certain needs are not met, like food, um, that you know our, our patients and our community as a whole is just not going to be as healthy as they could be. So the food pantry is for inpatients. So after they are admitted to the hospital, they will receive a visit for someone from case management. At that point, they will be asked a series of questions, and through those questions, it will be determined that they have a food insecurity. When a patient is food insecure, they're generally having issues accessing nutritious food on a consistent basis. Through these boxes that we provide them at their time of discharge, we can ensure that they receive nutritious foods that are in line with the diet that they're on while they're here. And this food pantry is very important for the patients who are living by themselves who doesn't have that much family or community help, it at least makes them get by for a few days so they can, recover and they can recover and get back to their work. I will receive a report, and through that report, I will identify um, what diet specific menu is for that patient. We have three different um, food pantry box options, one being diabetes friendly, one being healthy choice, and one being heart healthy. The heart healthy box will come with a blood pressure monitor cuff and a digital scale. Also provided in that box will be recipes and there will be resources in the community so that you will know where other uh, pantries are in your area. So now they, they have the education and they have the tools um, to move forward and to eat the correct things. And, and then they also have that, res that list of resources and other um, ways to, to get food. So they have that information, they have those tools, and our hope is that they, you know, will continue to use that. I was thinking, Lord, I, mm. I don't have much money to buy food. Should I get my medication or I save it or what? all the food so if I got the boxes of food and stuff I can go ahead and get my medication I'm good I'm blessed I didn't have no problem with that my mind was at ease actually I've been doing the hospitalist medicine uh, for the last 10 years I've never seen any hospital with this kind of program that's what really surprised us actually this really goes to our, you know who we are actually we're a county hospital we're here for the county and and our goal is to improve the health and well-being of this county and that this goes well with our goals Welcome back. We were talking a little bit about diabetes before we left, and one of the hot topics regarding diabetes is our modern medicines that are used to treat it. Mm -hmm. um, Ozampic is one, but there's several others in that class of medications. And um, from a surgeon, the problem for us is by way that it works, it makes you not hungry, and it's food stays in your stomach. And when people come to the operating room, they may have listened to our instructions to not eat or drink anything after midnight before the surgery. But if they've eaten longer than that, say dinner time, and they're taking Ozambic, there's still food in their stomach. So it's, mm -hmm. it's posing a problem for surgeons that's relatively recently discovered. We used to tell people, stop it a week before, and just last week we changed that to two weeks before. Oh, really? Right, um, and, and that has to pose problems for a, a, a primary care provider who's 
finally got somebody fine-tuned on a medicine that they like, and then we have to stop it right before a stressful surgery. Um, so your job never ends when, you, uh, when it comes time to uh, fine-tuning a, a disease like diabetes. Mm -hmm. Could you teach us a little bit about um, how you treat diabetes in general and, how, and the role of uh, modern medications are in this very common d disease that's in our community? Um, so, I don't have a special algorithm for diabetics because every patient is patient specific and um, unfortunately those newer medications come with a higher cost. And so... And oh, it's not always covered by insurance, is exactly. it? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah. So, you know, a lot, of my, a lot of my older patients are on some of the older medications like um, metformin and glipizide um, because that's what they can afford. If you can't afford a medication, it does me no good to prescribe it if you can't right. afford to take it. Right, because you won't take it, right. and then your diabetes is in worse it's control. It's in worse control. So uh, one of the things that we really try hard in our office is to get patient assistance. Um, we've done that for a while, but we really started it when UNC took over our practice because mm -hmm. we were um, initially taken, our samples were taken out of our inventory. Um, so the only way I could get some of these patients this medication and to even start or try um, and then be able to afford to continue was through patient assistance. Um, and a lot of the pharmaceutical companies have made it more easy and um, easy access for them to get the assistance. So I have to take that into account when I'm looking at what I'm going to start. So most of my Ozempic patients are younger, privately insured, um, tend to be more compliant with taking a shot. You know, a lot of patients, my older patients, think of a shot and they think of insulin, and Ozempic is not insulin. But to try to, to explain that sometimes, it, it can be a little challenging. And very time consuming, right? So. May I ask a question I was gonna ask a few minutes ago before you took the break? <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> you remembered it. I did, okay. um, I wrote it, I sort of wrote it down, but it, mentally. If someone wants to be your patient, how long might it take to be able to get into your system? And if it takes you know, a few days, is there another route perhaps that they could take if they feel like something's wrong? So right now, I think um, I'm scheduling into September um, because this is a new computer system for me. I have asked my staff to be a little lighter on my schedule um, just so I'm getting acclimated to this new system. Uh, so, you know, normally I would see 30 a day, and I'm trying to limit that a little less. Um, but if you're sick and you need or immediate care, that's exactly what my urgent care is for. You just walk in the door, 9 to, I think they take the last patient at 6.30. 9 to 6.30, you don't need to call, you don't need an appointment, you just walk in. And one of my, either my PA or my nurse practitioner will start the work up and try to fast track you into seeing me. And your PA has been working for 40 years, right? I mean, Correct. very experienced. Very experienced. And then the FMP is a fairly new graduate, right? She is, but she has had a lot of um, critical care and trauma experience mm -hmm. for 10 years as a nurse. Um, and she's remarkable. You know, mm -hmm. I, I mean, all of my, ha my staff has been handpicked. Um, but if somebody came in there and needed to see an MD, your staff then, the PA or the FMP, would access you to get the help they needed. Correct. And if they need something that, just like with the guy with a heart rate of 34, mm -hmm. they came and got me. Um, so, which really my PA had that. He didn't really need me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he had it covered. But, you know, it's always nice to have a second hands mm -hmm. when you're dealing with an emergency situation. But the back hallway is a straight open hallway so there's no door that separates the back hallway so if I just need to walk over there to that side and do and see somebody or or talk to them about a patient and vice versa they've come over to me um, and asked my opinion about an urgent patient that came in and then they'll say well we'll get you on a doctor Emanuel but at least we can get some treatment let's get it started yeah get it is, started. is the urgent care center open on weekends it's open on Saturday from 8 till 12.30 is the last appointment, so. When, see, when you see a newborn, is it, 
tell us why it would be important for a, a pregnant lady to be seen because of any impact you might see on a newborn, whether the mother had prenatal care or not. Well, there's some maternal illnesses like um, uncontrolled hypertension, gestational diabetes or diabetes during pregnancy mm -hmm. that impacts the newborn. Um, so the earlier you can get care and start treating these illness, you know, high blood pressure um, or diabetes for the mother, the better outcomes you see with the baby. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just for the mother's health as well. You know, this one of the most sad situations that I, I saw during my practice was a mother that had high blood pressure during her pregnancy, didn't know it, and she had a disease state called preeclampsia, which made her more susceptible to have a seizure, and she seized right after delivery, and she was neurologically devastated. Mm. I mean, so she has this brand new baby that she can't take care of. Um, and that could have been diagnosed earlier and treated. Definitely, could have been diagnosed mm -hmm. early in the pregnancy, and being and be monitored during the pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And does your practice limit who you will see? For example, by insurance. Um, so right now, our only insurance out of network is United Healthcare, but that's only until August the seventeenth. So, so uh, the greatest majority of these uh, of the population in, in the need that you demonstrated mm -hmm. may be poorly insured or underinsured mm -hmm. or Medicare, uninsured. Medicaid. We have right. me Medicare, Medicaid is not a problem. Good. Yeah. So, uh, or or no insurance or no insurance. So, right. Um, no I think that's a key thing. Is yes. that you? It, it's not in both of our practices. No insurance or poor insurance is not a reason to ignore yourself we're still dedicated to take care of you. And you'll still be treated the same. You're gonna be treated like family, no matter what insurance card, if you have one, that's in your wallet. That's very funny that you say that, because that is our motto, where everyone is treated as family. Right, and it is in my practice as well. Yes, so we have shirts that have that on the back of our shirts. Oh, that's kind of cool, I wish I thought of that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put mine on the front. <laughs> A question for you. Um, Last month I had two patients with scars on their forearm from suicide attempts. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, and they were uh, trying to draw attention to themselves. Um, and so I see them because they cut themselves. Uh, but, and I see that probably six times a year, uh, in last year. Mm -hmm. uh, and very rarely do they need to go to the operating room, but sometimes they do. Um, the year before less, the year before less, right. and the year before that even less. Um, I get the sense that there's an increasing incidence, and these are all adolescents, these are not adults. I get the sense that there's an increase in incidence in adolescent depression in our area. There is. Not that my practice is a good measure of that, but but as I sense it by, by the patient population that I see, mm -hmm. and we'll see anybody, um, and everybody, I'm thinking that it's probably a reflection of increasing depression in our area. We, as a whole, the United States has an increasing rates of depression in adolescents. Um, in 2009, it was roughly 8%, and it's up to almost 20% now. Wow, tremendous increase. Uh, a tremendous increase. And right. so, um, and I think it's a multi-factor, and lots of factors play into that, but I think one of the things that we really saw was um, during COVID when we were homeschooled and sports were cut out and extracurricular activities were cut out. Um, I could see that. I see. I saw a lot of more social isolation in in kids and and adolescents too, and even younger children. Um, and one of the other things that's happened more so in the last probably ten years is we've started screening a lot earlier we start screening in our clinic at 12. Good. That That's your clinic. What about schools or pa parent education programs? I mean, what does a parent look for for depression, for example? We know what to look for in our offices. We know what questions to ask. But how do we enable the public to say, I think something's wrong with my kid? Well, I mean, kids do not present like adults. They don't they present don't. sad and necessarily depressed. A lot of times they're 
personalities will change. They'll be more agitated, um, more withdrawn in their room, not hanging out with their peers, um, problems sleeping. Um, and, you know, I have a daughter that's 23 now, but I have three stepchildren. And so we've dealt with some of that in, with our stepchildren, actually, when in their 13 and 14 years age. Um, and it was more of like acting out, aggressive, angry behavior, not their normal behavior. Um, so really any, any smaller nuanced change in their personality should be a real red flag yeah. for a, a parent or a teacher. I mean, sometimes I mean, there's that age group that I always say between 13 and 17, those kids are, they're really tough to deal with. But um, Not my kids. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to kill my daughter at about 13. <laughs> um, but I mean, you just, you, and, and be vigilant. Look at their social media page. Look at their Snapchat. Um, I mean, there's a lot of information being shared with your children that you may not necessarily agree with or you may not even know that's being shared. Um, there's been a lot of talk that, you know, suicide's okay. It's not okay. Right. You know, it's not okay. No. Hurting yourself is you not okay. Can you put controls on computers, your kids' computers? Or? Um, I think you can. You know, I was always the that. person that would check my daughter's phone. Uh -huh. You know, I would look at her phone to see. Well, that could be potentially threatening, more threatening to your relationship with your daughter. So no, we had that open relationship. She knew. Yeah. Um, That's not a common thing, though. You know, so um, you know, so, but it does stress that if a parent is not an expert at diagnosing problems in their kids' mental capabilities, that perhaps an avid participation in a pediatric to internal medicine program may be in their best interest. Mm -hmm. now, just because they're healthy physically doesn't mean they don't need the occasional annual physical examination, which includes a mental assessment, doesn't exactly. it? Right, so all the more reason for families as a unit to make an appointment with either you or their PCP, if you have a relationship, then use it. Take your kids. Just because they're healthy and football stars doesn't mean that they don't have issues that you're not picking up on. But somebody as skilled as you would pick well, up on. And I want to stress that a sports physical is not an annual physical. So we do sports physicals and I, and I volunteer to do sports physicals in the community, but that's not your, that's not your physical. No, it's not a physical. My group has done hundreds of sports physicals uh, this year uh, for Edgecombe County, and uh, they're cursory. They're, uh, they're really to look at somebody's physical capabilities of doing that sport and by no means address uh, the general health of the child. And, right. if, and, and, and very significant things could be missed by a sports medicine physical. I have a question. Okay. We have a call-in question. Do you take Medicare and Medicaid both? Yes, okay. we do. What are some other things that people at home might have and they might just say, oh, this isn't really anything, but if it goes on, it needs to be seen and they might try and write it off? Because I think people are often in denial. Um, you know, well, I'm just tired all of a sudden or I'm something. The symptoms you gave for diabetes, but are there other things like hypertension and symptoms of that that they can know that this can really be bad if I don't get it, get a handle on it? I mean, definitely with hypertension, you can start having headaches, um, you know, blurred vision, or visual changes. Um, those are some of the earlier warning signs that there could be something going on that you don't need to just brush off. Um, a sudden increase in shortness of breath yes. when it, it wasn't present a little bit earlier. Yeah. So Swelling in your um, legs and your, your extremities. Um, we have a patient that just got found diagnosed with heart failure and his heart's pumping 25%. Wow. Um, and, and so fluid is backing up. backing up into his Downhill lungs. into his ankles. Yeah. Yeah. And so he just was in denial that he needed to take blood pressure medicine yeah. or treat blood pressure. And once they do, it can get that under control and yes. not only make them feel a whole lot better, but ward off 
strokes and heart attacks and all those things that would then incapacitate them. And I always try to tell my patients too, when you're li walking around with a blood pressure 180 over 100, your body will somewhat acclimate and get used to that blood pressure. Mm -hmm. But it'll come a point in time where um, it will not be able to keep up. So when I'm trying to bring your blood pressure down, it's like a roller coaster. You're all the way up at the top and that ride down can feel kind of bad. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and I try to do it gradually, but, you know, that's my job is to try to get your pressure down. And your job is to try to, to help me by being compliant with your medication, compliant with changing your diet, watching the sodium, try to exercise, mm -hmm. maybe lose 10 to 20% of your weight. Um, if you can. It's difficult to do. Um, it, beating up on that depression topic a little bit, some parents may, and teachers, non -care, not phys physician caregivers or primary care providers, may dismiss signs of depression as ADHD. Uh, something that is perhaps even it could be overdiagnosed or underdiagnosed as a another uh, mental uh, condition in, in kids. How do you distinguish ADHD um, uh, from depression? And is it a wastebasket diagnosis, meaning a diagnosis that everybody tends to throw um, a difficult diagnosis into? Um, so ADHD is typically diagnosed before the age of six, really. And it's in two settings. I mean, you're seeing it at home and you're seeing it at school. So my daughter has ADD. So, and I knew she did. <laughs> but she was not a problem child. She was a um, straight A student up until the third grade when she failed her EOGs. And I, and, and, but I really worked with her one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. Not because I didn't want her to have the diagnosis, I just didn't necessarily want her to be on medication if we could manage it. But then once it got to that point, then I knew her self-esteem was down and I knew we needed to get a handle on it. But I typically would tell you, you're not gonna see ADHD crop up all of a sudden in a 13 or 14 year old. Or somebody's not telling you the whole story. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are problems that, you know, oh, they were fidgety in school when they were in kindergarten, they didn't pay attention, they couldn't do their work, you know, they're just passed along in the system, oh, they're in the first grade and they're not learning how to sound out words or they're not learning how to read and they're in the second grade. So it would be something that you're, you're picking up sooner. So when I screen a child for ADHD, I screen with um, a Connor scale that I give the mom and the, a te their teachers. So they're each filling out um, their observations of the child. Because there is times I'll see a parent will circle numbers that look like the kid is just off the wall and the mm -hmm. teachers are like, no, this kid's great. And the grades are great. So then, then I'm like, okay, well, what's different at home that's not going on at school? Mm -hmm. And it may lead to other situations, social situations at right. home. Right. Right. Right, and then you explore those as well. Right. Right. So We've got a question. We have another question. Please reiterate that she does take new patients because we had someone, maybe they haven't seen the whole program. I'm not sure if they could hear you uh, talking in the no, background there. Could. But there's a telephone uh, call that came in that asked us uh, to reiterate whether you take new patients or not. And the answer is yes. You do take new patients. Yes. Right, and I think your number has been uh, posted. Um, that's our telephone number, and, okay. and this is Dr. Manuel's number, six seven six eight two eight five. If you call, you'll get an appointment. You will get an appointment. Um, if you walk in, they will schedule you an appointment. Right now, our phone lines are um, very busy. Right. <laughs> so, um, so it may take a little time to get through, but please try to continue to get through, or just walk in. And they'll give you the new patient walk in register. The urgent care. Part. No, you can walk into the primary care oh. and schedule an appointment. Okay. You just won't necessarily get to see me that day, but you can schedule your appointment and fill out your paperwork and get and get everything into our system. And you're right across from Ribeyes. Right across Nashville. from Ribeyes, right behind Bojangles. Good. Oh, Boja, uh oh, you got. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> we have all Good of biscuits. the bad fast food stuff. <laughs> we have a Dunkin' too right across the street. So. Mm. Uh, could you please also, the previous question was do you take new care 
for Medicaid, and she did say yes, but can you state the question for other people? Okay. Sure. The, the question that came in that you may not have heard was, does she take Medicare and Medicaid? Um, and the answer to that was yes. And I think we espoused on that and said that she'll take people if you have no insurance. That's correct. Right? Mm -hmm. You can have Blue Cross and Blue Shield. The one insurance that uh, uh, Dr. Manuel does not take yet is United Healthcare, correct? It's That's a common right. commercial insurance in our area. But that's a process issue. Uh, the application's in. We're waiting for United Health. August seventeenth. Yep. So she'll be impaneled uh, in mid-August to take mm -hmm. United Healthcare patients, and then there's no limitations on who she'll see. Um, and um, and most most private practices adopt that policy. We don't really care about insurance. We care about you and our job is to take care of you because we participate in this community as your family members. <laughs> yes, so we, um, so just to a little bit about the practice too, we have a lab, um, several of our labs we run in-house, a a hemoglobin A1C to check your diabetes, so in 10 minutes I'll Meaning know. you don't have to send them to no. an outside laboratory. No, we draw your blood inside, of our, inside of a lab in our, in our um, office and in 10 minutes, I'll know what your diabetes has been looking like for the last three months. Um, I can also check your cholesterol and have that report in 10 minutes and a complete blood count um, with your hemoglobin and a white count. Good. So, and, and then x-ray, yeah, we yeah, x -ray. have the state of the art x-ray. Mm -hmm. So Good. our x-ray machine, um, you do not need to lay down. Um, so, and we have a radiology group that doesn't overread, but typically I'll go in and look at the, the film or the, the monitor, and um, the next day I'll have an overread, but. And by overread, you mean that you've contracted with, with a, a radiologist. With a board certified radiologist right. to confirm whether your interpretation is supported by what their opinion is. Correct. Right. As a double you, check. As a double check. You said you don't have to lay down to be x-rayed. What body parts do you x-ray? Everything. Everything. Okay. Yes. Do you do mammograms? No, we do not do mammograms. Okay. We still contract, well, we don't contract, but we still refer our patients to um, NASH Day. Besides... Or MASH, the, the Women's Center, I'm sorry. Uh, besides the required immunizations to go to school, what other um, immunizations or vaccines do you recommend for children? I keep hearing meningitis before you go to college or things like that. Well, they're actually required. That's required now? They are required. I didn't know that. I yes, know that they yet. are. So um, Hepatitis. to go into the seventh grade, you're required to have a booster of your T, um, it's called a Tdap. It's tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis, the whooping cough. Mm -hmm. So tetanus and the whooping cough. Um, and you're also required to have your first dose of meningitis. Um, it's called MenVio. And it's for A Y W C. I think it's the that's in seventh grade. Seventh grade. Then at sixteen, you're required to have the Men B, which you see all the commercials. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The guy that's lifting weights and he has no legs. The girl that has a hearing aid in her ear. Those are all complications. Loss of limbs, lo hearing loss. Those are all complications from um, meningitis. meningitis B. Right. Group B. So they're required at 16, and then now the state requires that you get your second one before you enter the 12th grade. Hmm. Now these are uh, school-bound kids. What about homeschool children? There's no requirements for homeschool. What about Gardasil? Do you have pretty good compliance with parents opting to have that for their kids? No, I don't. Do you want to comment on that? Um, I think a lot of parents are just really afraid. Let, explain Gardasil, what, explain okay, what yeah, Gardasil yeah. is, right? So Gardasil is a vaccine um, that's been out for about 12 years for the human papilloma virus, which is a virus that's been linked to cancer in um, cervical cancer um, in girls and oropharyngeal cancer and anal cancer in boys. So um, we typically start at it can start as low as the age of nine. I don't endorse it at nine. I usually start about 12. Mm -hmm. um, but it's either in two or three doses, depending on when you start the, the um, vaccine series. And it is a vaccine against the, you know, HPV is sexually transmitted. But, you know, my thought processes is that they're going to be adults and they're 
more than likely going to be sexually active. And if I can give a child a vaccine for something that could potentially prevent a cancer down the line, then, you know, I would endorse it. You know, my, my daughter and I, my, my three stepchildren have all had all four, all three of their shots. And it's been around long enough that there are really no, no side effects or down, downside to it, No, right? but I have seen older, I've seen older people with um, HPV-related colon, or rectal, rectal and cervical cancer. Meaning those that never got vaccinated. Never got vaccinated. Right, so the downside of not getting that vaccine can be life-threatening. Correct. And life-saving to have a benign vaccine without any side effects. The most common side effects are just like with any vaccines, uh, soreness. Injection and, site, and soreness. Injection site, um, some uh, low-grade fever, maybe feel tired, arm may be sore for a little, for a day. Just like with a tetanus shot, though. Mm -hmm. I mean. What about um, the new shingle shot? Is it Shingrix? Shingrix? Yeah. Do you... Put, do you encourage people to have that? I do encourage people to have that. We do not support that in the clinic just because of right now the reimbursement is not good for insurance. Mm -hmm. So we um, have to write a prescription and send you to the pharmacy to get it. You've seen some really painful shingle cases, shingles cases, I'm sure. I have. Oh, yeah. And what about pneumonia shots? How I important are they? I definitely encourage those. So, you know, uh, you may not know, but we have a new pneumococcal Prevnar 20 that's indicated. Um, Hopefully, we'll get pediatric indication. Hopefully, then the and fall. that's the vaccine. That's for, the vaccine for pneumonia. It's pneumococcal twenty, so that means that's it, every five years or sooner. Prevnar twenty is one and done. Yeah. Yeah. So now, if you've had pneumococcal twenty three, you are still and you have underlying medical like diabetes, heart disease, chronic kidney disease, um, any kind of respiratory long standing chronic diseases, you're eligible to get a Prevnar 20, and then you've completed your series. But we're hoping to get the pediatric indication in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, if there's vaccines that are required to go through school and uh, a child is homeschooled, do, the, do admitting colleges, if they were to go into a college, require that vaccine to enter into the college? No. From my experience, they do not because what's happened, because um, you can go to school without these vaccines uh, on a religious exemption. Mm -hmm. So um, if you have a religious exemption, you do not have to have them to go into college. But things like the meningitis one and all, when they go to college and they're in dorm environments and whatnot, I mean, that's a terrible thing to risk having a child be exposed to. I mean, not the only thing, but. I mean, it's only come to light in recent years how really important that is now that there's something available for it. I have to make sure we get this question. Okay. This was a <laughs> telephone call that I actually covered up with a piece of paper. It was our first telephone call. It was our first telephone call. <laughs> that actually came in from a very excited uh, caller who actually called before we went on air. Wow, and, very and, excited. And yeah. they wanted to ask the question. <laughs> Is it your husband? <laughs> no, he's in Chicago. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, what made you open your own practice, and what makes your practice unique? Okay, so the answer to the first question, um, it was a lot of little things that added up to just um, general dissatisfaction in healthcare. I mean, it had came in, gotten to the point where I did not want to go to work and it was, was because it dissatisfaction um, in the business of the healthcare well, or the, the the corporation the of healthcare once I was bought out um, so example in our office and now in my office if you are a little dehydrated because you've been out working and you gotten too much sun and you're run down and you come in and you need a bag of fluids you're gonna get a bag of fluids Right. I could not do that before. Right. Under UNC. There's too many rules and regulations and hoops to jump through. Eventually, I was able to because I had to get a pump and a regulator and go through all this special training with my staff. And that was two and a half years into the making to get my IV pump. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I had a baby that came in with a febrile seizure and broken up in my crash car. Nothing to break a seizure. Baby seized for 15 minutes. As a pediatrician, that's the most helpless feeling that you ever have is to hold a seasoned baby, knowing that you can do something and you just don't have the means to do it. 
Um, it, my panel had been closed. I was not allowed to take any new adult patients. Um, I could only take pediatric patients if they were a sibling of somebody that I was already seeing. We have so many babies being born that need a pediatrician and I just, my hands were tied. Um, I had so many families that wanted to, their grandma to establish with me, but I couldn't take them because my panel was closed. And, then and by, by panel, you mean the, the ability to schedule another new patient. patient? Right. Right. So, and then the final straw <laughs> was when they said, you can only see X amount of patients a day. Well, what if that patient that walks in needs to be seen? Well, you can send them to one of the other providers. Okay, well, that provider knows nothing about this patient. I've been here 18 years. And why, how does that make sense? Right. So that's why I said, you know, I, if I'm going to practice medicine for another 18 years, which I intend to do, then I need to practice it my way. Right. And that's important, another 18 years. So people who are thinking about coming to you, it's not like you're going to be retiring in a year or two. No, but that was the story that I wrote. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and working for an institution like UNC or ECU is a perfect fit for many style, it is. Mm -hmm. for many style it doctors. Is. And they excel in that environment, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and the beauty of not having to work for somebody else is if you want to style your practice after your, uh, how you define how to treat people ethically uh, without restrictions, it just makes you a better practitioner. Um, not that the institutions ever do a bad job, but it could put uh, reins on you that stop you from doing things the way that you do it, and therefore you can't excel. Right. Um, and uh, I think if you interviewed most people in private practice, they've experienced that. Um, um, when I interviewed uh, at a teaching hospital when I first came to North Carolina, my deal breaker in taking that job was they wouldn't let me put my cell phone number on my business card. Oh. Right? Okay. Um, and you write it on people's arms after you do surgery. I now, do. So. <laughs> I want to be reached by the patient. I was told, well, the residents or the medical students will take care of their mm -hmm. problem. Well, they don't know what I did. Oh, they're your patients. Right? They're my patients, mm -hmm. and and I want and I owe them. And that's that's uh, and that was my restriction. And everybody in private practice has their own thing. But I applaud you for um, for going on your own. Uh, and freeing yourself up so that you can practice in the style that you feel comfortable in doing so. And, and this community has room for both employed doctors mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that excel in that mm -hmm. uh, environment mm -hmm. and ones like us that excel in our, when, we, when we carve our own pathway. Right. Right. And, and there's room for that. We are out of time. So that's we a are good out of to time. To end on. <laughs> well, Dr. Manuel, thank you for joining Jean thank and you I for today. Me. We thank really you. appreciate you and, and thanks for, you know, going into practice in our community and staying here and committing to us. Um, and we will bring you another edition of Call the Doctor in the near future. Good night. Good night. Good night.